Great. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mignon McCulloch. I'm based at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town, and it really is my privilege and pleasure to be co-hosting with Mati Vieja today. And our theme for today's uh, webinar is that of uh, on oncology. And so our two topics today will be oncological emergencies, the early recognition and treatment, as well as childhood cancer awareness, red flag signs of pediatric cancer. And we're very lucky today in that we've got two very experienced um, uh, oncologists. And the first one uh, is somebody I've known for a long time, Helda de Quintel. He is South African trained. He then went and worked for many years in the UK, in London, both um, in the private sector, but also in the NHS sector and comes back not only with lots of oncology skills, but also some really good management skills as well. And so um, I'm going to hand over to Helda uh, to tell us all about oncological emergencies. I have currently got load shedding in Cape Town, but I have got an inverter. So I'm hoping that we will continue without any problems. So Helda, thank you very much over to you. And thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thanks, Mignon, for the kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to, this, to, to present to you oncological emergencies, um, essentially the recognition and the management of oncological emergencies. Um, I'm, for the sake of bandwidth, I'm going to switch my camera off, and then we'll do the presentation uh, without the camera. I'm going to just share my screen. And if someone can, and Mignon, if you can just let me know that you're able to see the screen. It all looks good. We can see you and we can hear you. Thank you, Helda. Okay, I'm just going to try and see if I can switch my bandwidth off. Just let me try and switch my camera off first. Is that clear? You can see? That's all good. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. We can hear you loud and Thank you. So cancer and its therapy may lead to medical conditions, some of which may be an emergency. And the care of oncological patients with emergencies presents a challenge, not only to the medical oncologist, but to also the clinicians involved in their care. An oncological emergency is defined as an acute condition that can be brought on by the cancer itself or its treatment, and it requires rapid intervention to avoid death or also severe permanent damage uh, and to improve clinical outcomes. A multidisciplinary approach, including close collaboration with a pediatric oncologist is essential to ensuring the best possible outcome. So on the slide, we define the class or we have a classification for oncological emergencies. And these can be placed into three uh, subcategories. The first being metabolic, um, and this would include tumor lysis syndrome. The second would be hematological. And in this group, we have the febrile neutropenia, hyperleukocytosis and hyperviscosity syndrome. And in the third subcategory, it's the structural or the, the mass effects, the space occupying lesions that cause compression. And those include superior vena cable syndrome, superior mediastinal syndrome, spinal cord compression, and raised intracranial pressure. So we're going to just take each one of these topics. I've just covered essentially the ones I felt were most important and the ones very pertinent to oncology. And we're going to take, take each topic uh, and give you a description and give you a management for each one. So the first one being tumor lysis syndrome. So tumor lysis syndrome is a life-threatening oncological emergency, and it results from the rapid lysis of tumor cells and the abrupt, abrupt release of intracellular contents into the circulation. This then results in uh, numerous electrolyte abnormalities, and these can include hyperuricemia, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypercalcemia. It usually occurs upon commencement of chemotherapy, but may also occur spontaneously in highly proliferative tumors. 
It is most commonly seen in tumors such as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and other le acute leukemias. And it may also occur in other cancers that are large and are chemosensitive. The clinical manifestations we see in patients are usually related to the electrolyte abnormalities. And these can include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, tetany, paresthesias, seizures, cardiac dysarrhythmias, and sudden death. Patients are at the highest risk of tumor lysis syndrome within 12 to 72 hours of initiating chemotherapy, and they may remain susceptible up to seven days from the initiation of chemo. So here on the, on the slides I'm showing you is essentially a patient we had here at the Red Cross, and you can see two uh, CT images. It is of the same patient demonstrating the extensive amount of abdominal disease seen in a patient with Burkitt's lymphoma. And what you can clearly see on the slide on the left is that there's renal involvement. So not only is there a tumor in the, in the abdomen, but there's also a tumor involving the kidneys. So with this degree of bulky disease um, and this degree of renal involvement, this patient is very, at very high risk of developing tumor lysis syndrome. The image on the right, you can see clearly where the arrow is demarcating a lymphoma, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma involving the wall of the, of, the, of the colon. Again, extensive bulky disease, which places this patient at very high risk of developing tumor lysis syndrome. So the pathophysiology of tumor lysis syndrome is essentially the tumor that breaks down and it causes the release of intracellular uh, electrolytes, including potassium, phosphate, and purines from the DNA. Um, and then these purines are metabolized to uric acid by the xanthine oxidase pathway, which you can see below there. The phosphate binds calcium and then precipitates into calcium phosphate crystals. And this in turn results in secondary hypocalcemia. Both the calcium phosphate crystals and the uric acid deposits in the renal tubules, and these cause acute kidney injury or renal insufficiency. This in turn worsens the hyperphosphatemia and the hyperkalemia. And so on the second slide, you can see that xanthine oxidase pathways, that the two drugs that we use commonly in the management of tumor lysis syndrome work at the xanthine oxidase pathway and at the urate oxidase uh, in order to try and reduce the uric acid production. The best treatment for tumor lysis syndrome is essentially anticipating it. And so one should anticipate tumor lysis syndrome in patients with very high white cell counts, in patients with raised LDH, in patients with bulky disease, as we saw on that CT scan, and in patients with very chemosensitive tumors. The management and the prevention of tumor lysis syndrome involve uh, hydration of the patient, uh, essentially with potassium-free fluids, and we usually run these at three liters per meter squared per day. The early commencement of allopurinol for medium-risk patients, and then the use of respiricase, so replacing uh, allopurinol with respiricase in patients with very high-risk disease. Importantly, that in patients, male patients who are going to commence respiricase, that we do test for G6PD, as this has the potential to cause hemolytic anemias. One needs to maintain a good urine output, usually between two to three mils per kilo per hour, and if this urine output is not being met, one can consider the use of diuretics such as fruzamide. One needs to keep monitoring the electrolytes in the first 24 to 48 hours, repeating the electrolytes and is including the calcium magnesium phosphate every six hours. And then one needs to correct the electrolyte abnormalities that can occur. And these include hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. Importantly, with the hypocalcemia, that one only treat symptomatic hypocalcemia because treating calcium can essentially result in it binding to phosphate and further precipitating 
and aggravating calcium phosphate precipitation in the renal tubules. So one has to be very careful. And then lastly, dialysis can also be considered in life-threatening and refractory electrolyte derangements in acute, in acute kidney injury and also in fluid overload. So we move on to the next oncological emergency, which is febrile neutropenia. So febrile neutropenia is common in oncological patients and with up to 80% receiving chemotherapy for hematological mal malignancies, developing febrile neutropenia at least once during the course of treatment. It is considered a medical emergency and it is important that we commence antibiotics as soon as possible. We talk of the golden hour and essentially what that means is commencing the antibiotic within an hour of the patient arriving in hospital. And so it is at, of utmost importance that we start antibiotics as soon as possible. So how do we define febrile neutropenia? Well, it's defined as a fever of great or equal to 38 degrees Celsius, and also a neutrophil count of below 500 cells per microliter. A neutrophil count of below 1,000 cells per microliter can also be defined as neutropenia if one expects the, neutrophil fall, the neutrophils to fall below, the, the, below one within 48 hours. So one can see is that febrile neutropenia will lead to septic shock and to death if there are any delays in commencement of antibiotics. So how do we manage febrile neutropenia? Well, one needs to follow the ABCs. We essentially have got to manage the airway. We've got to provide oxygen if the patient requires oxygen. We've got to obtain prompt IV access, and we've got to resuscitate the patient if the patient is in shock. So common resuscitation fluids that we use are normal saline or ringer's lactate at 20 mls per kilo. One needs to then obtain blood cultures. And once we have the blood cultures, we can then commence the delivery of the first dose of broad spectrum antibiotics. This is usually in the form of PIPTAS and antibiotics. This is what we use here. But one really needs to consider uh, what antibiotics are being used in your institution and then follow suit. What is important to note is that febrile neutropenia definition can differ from different hospital that you may be working in. And so it is important that each institution have a written standing operating procedure for febrile neutropenia so that we don't have any delays or any mistakes. One can consider doing a chest x-ray if there were any respiratory symptoms. One can also consider doing other cultures uh, as appropriate. So we may consider doing urine, sputum, or CSF, depending on what is found clinically when we see the patient. Transfusion of blood products may also be required because often these patients have significant bone marrow suppression, and so the platelets and hemoglobin may be ex also extremely low. The next is hyperviscosity syndrome or hyperleukocytosis. So what is hyperleukocytosis? This is a white blood cell count of greater than 100 times 10 to the 9 cells per liter. This is commonly seen in patients with hematological malignancies, especially acute lymphoid leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, and chronic myeloid leukemia. Hyperleukocytosis is a medical emergency, which if left untreated may result in leukostasis, that lead to multi-organ failure can lead to hemorrhagic complications and even possibly death. The pathogenesis behind uh, leukostasis is essentially the leukemic blasts become much less deformable than normal leukocytes. They cause sludging and the development of thrombi in the microcirculation, which in turn leads to organ hyperperfusion. This in turn will manifest as numerous uh, symptoms, which I'll see in the next slide. One can also see that they may present concomitantly with tumor lysis syndrome. So the organ systems that can often be hyperperfused and manifesting with specific signs and symptoms are as follows. 
neurological, one can manifest with altered level of consciousness, headaches, seizures, confusion, stroke, or intracranial hemorrhage. The respiratory system can manifest with symptoms of ARDS, with dyspnea, tachypnea, hypoxia, and or respiratory failure. The cardiac system, when this is involved, may result or manifest with myocardial infarction or pulmonary edema. The genitourinary system when man can manifest with priapism or acute renal failure. And when the eyes are involved, they can manifest with blurred vision, diplopia, central retinal vein occlusion, or retinal detachment. The principle of management of hyperleukocytosis again includes hyperhydration to reduce the blood viscosity. And we usually use a rate of three liters per meter squared per day. Careful monitoring of urine output and maintaining a uvolemic state is important. One needs to avoid unnecessary blood transfusions in patients who are hemodynamically stable, as this may worsen the blood viscosity. Patients can be transfused platelets to maintain a platelet count above 50 to prevent the bleeding complications and any CNAS complications. The definitive management consists of the appropriate chemotherapy to decrease the, the tumor load. The prevention of tumor lysis syndrome and the correction of metabol metabolic abnormalities as previously discussed are important measures in the management of hyperleukocytosis. Leukophoresis and exchange transfusions may also be considered in refractory and symptomatic hyperleukocytosis. The next oncological emergency is superior vena cable syndrome and superior mediastinal syndrome. So what is supravena cable syndrome? This is when you get external compression by a mass or a lymph node of the SVC or an internal occlusion of the SVC by a tumor or a thrombus. Implantable intravenous devices such as uh, portocaps or Hickman lights may increase the risk of thrombosis of the SVC. What is supramediastinal syndrome? Well, this is usually a mediastinal mass, a mass that compresses the trachea or the main stem bronchus, leading to airway compromise. The majority of mediastinal masses in children are in the anterior mediastinum. Common cancers that occur in the anterior mediastinum that manifest with a mediastinal mass are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, germ cell tumor, and thymoma. Posterior mediastinal masses are often attributed to neuroblastoma. The clinical presentation of a patient with superior vena cable syndrome can include facial swelling, prominent superficial chest veins, plethora, headaches, altered mental state, and visual disturbances. Patients with superior mediastinal syndrome may have the following symptoms. Dyspnea, respiratory distress, stridor, cough, cyanosis, and orthopnea. Importantly, orthopnea in children is extremely ominous sign. The diagnosis usually entails getting a chest x-ray. So a plain chest x-ray is preferred as a diagnostic tool in children because supine positioning and general anesthesia that are usually required for CT scan can carry significant risk for catastrophic airway obstruction, particularly if the child is laid flat. The chest x-ray may also identify pleural or pericardial effusions that are often associated with a mediastinal mass. Other investigations that may aid in the making a diagnosis include a full blood count, a blood film, tumor markers, including LDH, alpha feta protein, and beta HCG, peripheral blood and or pleural fluid sent for immunophenotyping, a bone marrow 
aspirate or lymph node biopsy done under local anesthetic. A mediastinal biopsy can usually be reserved uh, in patients where less invasive diagnostic tests have not yielded the diagnosis as yet. So here we've got x-rays uh, of two patients that were treated here at the Red Cross. The first on the left is a patient with a T-cell lymphoma. It was a 10-year-old who presented with a mediastinal mass, as you can clearly see on the x-ray, and an associated pleural effusion. The x-ray on the right, this is of another patient who was 14 years old, and as you can see, had an extensive, very large mediastinal mass, associated pleural effusion on the left with mediastinal shift and tracheal deviation. So the management involves avoiding painful procedures. Patients should be allowed to position themselves in a position of comfort in a way in which they protect their own airway. Patients with respiratory distress may require oxygen via face mask or nasal prongs. Adequate IV access is important, but should, not, should be avoided if causing excessive distress or anxiety. The fluid status of the patient should be optimized to maintain sufficient venous return and cardiac output. Sedation must be avoided as this may result in hypertension, tracheal collapse, and a loss of airway. Once diagnostic samples have been obtained, then one can consider starting steroids and appropriate chemotherapy. Radiotherapy can also be considered, but is usually not necessary because usually these, treat, these uh, tumors usually respond very well to steroids. Thrombosis-related SVC obstruction is treated with the removal of the intravascular device and the commencement of anticoagulation. And in some circumstances, vascular stenting or surgical intervention may be considered. The next oncological emergency is that of spinal cord compression. So spinal cord compression is a medical emergency that if not treated may result in permanent neurological impairment. It is reported in about 5% of pediatric patients with solid tumors. Spinal cord compression can be the presenting symptom of a primary tumor, or can also be a presenting symptom of a metastasis from a primary tumor somewhere else, or due to an isolated recurrence. Most tumors from the spinal cord are extradural, and common causes for spinal cord tumors causing compression on neuroblastoma, soft tissue sarcomas, lymphomas, and some CNS tumors, including low-grade glioma and ependymoma. The symptoms of spinal cord compression are back pain, and this is usually quite uncommon in children. So when a child presents with back pain, it is usually an ominous sign and one should investigate this. Other associated symptoms include gait abnormality, motor and sensory deficits, incontinence to feces and urine. The diagnosis requires a, firstly a formal neurological examination. Spinal x-rays are abnormal only in about 30 to 35% of cases. And hence, the MRI is the preferred modality for investigating spinal cord compression. And again, the two slides here are essentially two patients that we had in our hospital at Red Cross. The first with this extensive tumor in the paraspinal gutter with extension into the intervertebral foramina causing spinal cord compression. And the second on the right is a very high thoracic tumor. It was a low-grade glioma in the upper thorax or thoracic spine that caused compression of the spine and the patient displayed neurological symptoms. 
the management usually involves treatment of evolving neurological symptoms as quickly as possible so as to avoid permanent irreversible damage. And this usually requires the administration of IV dexamethasone and appropriate directed chemotherapy. Management warrants a full multidisciplinary approach. A neurosurgeon should be consulted to consider the possibility of a spinal cord decompression and biopsy, uh, an expedited biopsy at the same time. Radiotherapy may also be considered in very severe cases. Lastly, raised intracranial pressure. This can cause cerebral herniation and rapidly lead to severe neurological disability and death. Causes most often include an intracranial mass or obstruction of the CSF outflow. Presenting symptoms include headaches, vomiting, altered level of consciousness, ataxia, diplopia, seizures, and a Cushing's reflex. Again, a Cushing's reflex is usually a very late and ominous sign. A CT scan can rapidly evaluate the presence of raised intracranial pressure or impending cerebral herniation and an MRI done at a later stage may further characterize the cause for the raised intracranial pressure. So here I've got examples. The first is of a CT scan of a patient who had upstream hydrocephalus caused by a brainstem mass. And the second is an MRI imaging of a patient with gliosarcoma of the posterior fossa, again, who developed upstream hydrocephalus. The management, the immediate management entails stabilizing the airway and even the possible requirement of intubation and hyperventilation. An IV access should be established and the early commencement of IV dexamethasone should be considered. Other drugs such as mannitol and hypertonic saline may also aid in reducing the intracranial pressure. Other neuroprotective measures that can also be done include the management of seizures, the management of pyrexia, and pain. Importantly, urgent neurosurgical intervention should be sought, as the patient may require an a, a, a urgent CSF diversion procedure in the form of either an extraventricular drain or a third uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, or a ventral peritoneal shunt. A tumor resection or biopsy can also be considered under the same setting. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy can also be considered once we have a diagnosis. So in conclusion, oncological emergencies are associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Early recognition and prompt treatment can reduce the potential complications and improve clinical outcome. A multidisciplinary approach is essential and one needs to involve your friendly pediatric oncologist as soon as possible. My last slide just includes my reference for this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helda, for a really um, excellent presentation. It's always really useful to know what those big emergencies are to look out for. Your first one, the tumor lysis syndrome, I must say you've really given me my sleep back by using Raspiricase. Um, it's something that I used when I worked in the UK and the guys there had never really seen tumor lysis for the last 10 years. Um, and since introducing it at Red Cross, I must say our incidence of dialysis has really um, decreased significantly. I know it's an expensive drug, but I do think it's actually worth the cost. And if you look at how much it costs to dialyze somebody to put in all the lines and, and all the um, associated monitoring, um, for those of you who haven't used it, I would definitely recommend it. I think it's it well pays its money in, in, in terms of the dialysis um, facilities. So... I'm going to ask you guys to please put some questions in the chat box because I know that Helda is on call tonight. So 
he needs to go. So I'm not sure if there are any questions um, for anybody. And I'm, while I'm waiting for questions, I'm going to ask Elder. So you are like the nephrologist, quite a rare breed. There are not many of you around the country. Um, and I'm sure you take lots of calls. Um, which of these medical emergencies do you think can be managed remotely? And which do you think need to advise people to come in pretty straight away? Yeah, I mean, I think I wouldn't be, uh, I think once one is determined you've got a medical emergency, you really need to come in. I don't think it's something we should be managing remotely. Of right. course, if they're out uh, with their medical teams, uh, then yes, I think it is something we can manage remotely and it's a discussion. But essentially when they require quite extensive multidisciplinary care um, and they're going to require an urgent treatment, which is often the case, then I think they do need to be sent to a referral center to start treatment as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Um, and delighted to see how much training is actually happening. Andrew um, Ferrerina has put a risk of tumor lysis syndrome is high, white cell count in leukemia. <laughs> is there a rough cutoff where the incidence increases significantly? Yeah, I mean, they, they use the cutoff of 100, um, but I would say that your, your risk is, I think, definitely higher once you're beyond 200. And they usually suggest that we start with spiricase preventatively uh, in a white cell count of 200, but we tend to, to, to use it even in white cell counts of 100. So, you know, I've seen white cell counts that are at 100 with very extensive tumor lysis, and then I've seen ones in which you've had a white cell count of 200 and they breeze through. So an absolute cutoff, no, but one should always anticipate it. And I think that's the... the I think the take-home message, anticipate, monitor, and treat. And once you've shown that the patient is developing a tumor lysis, so that we don't ignore it, we, we start treating and we, we preempt it. And I do think that um, these conditions are best managed as a team uh, with your oncologist leading the way. Um, but it, these kids are often really, really sick, uh, often sicker than anybody else I've ever actually looked after. And I must say, it's always, I really appreciate having a team of people, not just oncology, nephrology, but intensive care and gen, good general pediatricians and emergency medicine docs, just everybody working hand in hand, obviously with the surgeons as well. Absolutely. So one more question for you, Kalambai, why not methylpred? What is the advantage of dexamethasone compared to methylpred in your experience? Um, I don't think there's a much of a difference. I think both steroids work very well. Uh, I think that dexamethasone, the advantages when you're dealing with leukemias then in which you're trying to treat CNS diseases that essentially you have better CNS penetration. Uh, it's, it, it defeats the, 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 the permeability the, of the membrane of the CNS, so it tends to penetrate better. But they both do work, um, and I think if you're at your institution and that's what you've got available to you, then that's what I would use. Yeah, and I think that's really important. I do quite a lot of work for Medicine Sans Frontier and often it's just whatever you've got available in your cupboard at the time. Um, so often there are theories about one which is better than the other, but um, it is also dependent on what you've got available at the time. Um, Elder, you're getting lots of questions, which is great. Is there still a role for urinary alkalization in tumor lysis syndrome? So we have used it in our center, but I think it's got to be used with, you've got to be very careful. Essentially, the issue around the alkalization of the urine is that essentially you do, you inhibit the, the excretion of phosphate. So you may actually worsen the hypophosphatemia. So if you've got a patient with a very high phosphate, um, then I would suggest we don't use, that we don't alkalinize the urine. So I'm going to say it has a limited role and it's just got to be done cautiously. Great. So that's really helpful. Um, I just want to see if you've got anything else. I think that's about it. Um, so just want to say thank you once again. I know how stressful it is 
trying to do an on-call and trying to give a talk. So uh, oh, thank fine. you very much to everybody for not bothering you while you were giving the presentation. Really enjoyed it, really nice and clear. I'm going to borrow that talk from you sometime, Hilda, and uh, hope you have a quiet night on call. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. So um, don't run away, everybody. We've got a lovely second speaker. <clears throat> her name is Mampo Jonas, who completed her undergraduate studies at the University of Free State and then decided she really liked PED. So lucky for us, she did her MMED and her FCP, again at the University of Free State. And she was passionate about pediatric oncology and treats patients not just from the Free State, but also from a neighboring country like Lesotho. Um, and she believes in empowering parents and communities um, as the key to early detection of pediatric cancers. So um, her topic today is childhood cancer awareness, the red flags that we should be aware of. Mampo, do you want to turn on your camera so that everybody can see um, what you look like and uh open your microphone and the floor is all yours. I can see you and I'm hoping I can hear you. Afternoon everyone, can you hear me a minute? And hear you very nicely, off you go. Thank you so much everyone. As we all know, um, September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and it is critical and it is vital because pediatric cancer isn't a topic that many people would like to discuss. It is a rather sensitive topic, not just amongst our communities, um, but also amongst our professionals. What we do know is that the Global Can estimates that the incidence of pediatric cancers um, in children aged 40, zero to 14 years in Africa ranges from about 73 per million for girls and 99 per million for boys. More than 80 to 90% of children with malignancies in the United States will become long-term survivors. But unfortunately, we cannot say the same in our African setting um, with survival in African communities being about 20 to 30% or even lower actually um, than in our developed countries. And the main problem we have seen is that most of these cases present with advanced disease. And the problem is that with presentation with advanced disease, your mortality risk is much higher. So as a problem was already noted, it is then becomes vital that we teach people what the early warning signs are, um, not just the parents, um, but also the healthcare professionals, because research has shown that about 85% of these children that present with pediatric malignancies actually do present with some or other early warning sign. Thus, it becomes critical that whoever sees them at an early stage, be it at home or be it the healthcare professionals, that they are already aware of this and they look out for these clinical conditions. In our first world countries, we will have cases presenting much earlier. I do not know if it is a culture in our African communities that our patients generally present late. As you can see on the current screen, we have four different pa patients and this is just an indication of what we normally see. And this is why we have a totally different picture to what the developing country, the developed countries are seeing because by the time our patients present, the burden of disease is so much higher. And with that, unfortunately, most of them will present with metastatic disease. So having noted this problem and this challenge that our developing countries have a much lower overall survival. Um, in 1999, the South African um, Children's Cancer um, Study Group got together and tried to address this problem. And in addressing it, um, they had extensive discussions, which then brought about what we call the St. Siluans, um, comp compilation of the St. Siluans clinical warning signs or warning signs that should 
alert caregivers and healthcare professionals of the possible problems and the warnings that further investigation should be done. The aim of this was to try and increase awareness amongst the communities and amongst healthcare professionals in an effort that our patients could try present earlier and in so doing with early presentation that we could get improved outcome uh, with our patients. So what have the studies shown? What we do know is that it's not just the parents that bring the children late, but we find that there are health system problems as well and healthcare worker problems that lead to delayed um, presentation. So when you look at the parent factors, we have things like failure to recognize symptoms, delay seeking health care, seeking of alternative care, and there we're talking specifically self-medication, traditional healer visitations, and also some of them will just say the church says that they are healed and thus they present late or either do not believe that they are actually ill. And then in some other places, you get patients with financial constraints because they live in deep rural areas or are unemployed and thus struggle to actually reach the healthcare facilities. When we look at system factors or physical factors, you get patients that are incorrectly diagnosed or reach a diagnosis after prolonged workup or delayed treatment or incorrect treatment for other conditions. Then you also have patients that instead of coming to pediatric oncology will do the rounds and go to other specialities. And most commonly we have patients that will either be stuck at ophthalmology with multiple biopsies or will be in the surgical disciplines and they follow up biopsy results a month or two months later or the patient will just not follow up and then will be stuck in that specific speciality or when they do get the results, they don't refer the patient to us. So we also get delayed referral of a pro for patients in order to get appropriate treatment. So the question remains, how do we actually try and improve the outcome? We need to have a high index of, of suspicion. Um, we need to be able to identify high-risk groups. And of course, we need to be aware if there's red flag signs that are indicating that the patient needs to be referred to us. So with high index of suspicion, it is basically a clinical um, feel or gut feel or thorough investigation that will lead you to that. Um, when we're looking at the high-risk groups, you look at patients with neurofibromatosis that are known to get a variety of malignant and benign tumors. You get patients with chromosomal abnormalities, and here we're referring mainly to patients with trisomy 21 that we know um, will, be, will get some malignancies. We also get patients with Fanconi anemia um, and other genetic abnormalities. Then also when we look at patients with immunodeficiency states, most commonly HIV, they're also at risk of malignancy. And here and there you will see our, our patients with severe combined immune deficiency and patients with ataxia, telangiectasia. Um, this is a patient um, that has multiple hyperpigmented uh, macules. Um, we see they, it, is, it is important when we talk about patients that are at high risk of malignancies that we do thorough investigations. When we talk in patients with Fanconi anemia and neurofibromatosis, the skin is a very important organ to examine thoroughly. Um, and not just the skin, um, but the rest of the clinical examination, the eyes are also important. Um, and then you need to look for other dysmorphic features. Here's a patient with trisomy 21, and here's a very nice example of a patient with Fanconi anemia. Most of these patients present at the age between, between five and seven years old. Um, and most of them would have presented a few times here and there with an episode of epistaxis at the local clinic or just on history that the child regularly gets epistaxis that wasn't attended to. So 
you need to look at the patient in totality, um, do a thorough head to toe examination, look at the face, look at the eyes, um, look at the nose bridge, look at the mandible, um, look at the chin, look at the hands. Um, those hands are nice and small. Um, you can see those fingers are very short. Um, the wrist actually looks quite wide, so it would be very important to feel for the pulse to rule out um, thrombocytopenia and ataxia, telangiectasia. Um, you want to look at the skin as well. You want to look for clinodactyly. Um, and obviously, when you pick up that there's abnormalities on the clinical examination, then you need to follow up with your investigations. Um, your patients with Fanconi anemia will generally um, get a macrocytic, uh, macro, uh, macrocytic anemia, and that is usually a clue that we've noted, um, not clinically proven, but somehow their MCV is usually quite elevated and they usually have typical findings. We obviously would need to investigate for molecular abnormalities and genetic abnormalities to confirm our diagnosis with our DB and our molecular studies. Again, continuing with the high-risk groups, our patients, if you have a patient that has been diagnosed with a malignancy, then you need to look at the siblings as well because they're also at risk, especially if you have a twin sibling um, patients with metabolic diseases are also at risk, and patients with congenital malformations or syndrome, um, patients with conditions like beckwith wiedemann syndrome and hemihypertrophy are at risk of developing a villum's tumor or nephroblastoma. Here's a nice picture of a patient with aniridia and hemihypertrophy. So it is important, as I've already said, that we examine the patient thoroughly and do a head-to-toe examination. Our patients that have had prior malignant disease and would have been treated with chemotherapy or radiotherapy before are also at risk of developing subsequent malignancies. So when a patient presents with a secondary malignancy, it is important to establish what treatment were they on previously, firstly, what their initial diagnosis was, and what treatment they were exposed to so that you can know which risk factors they have for developing secondary malignancies. Also, there's patients that have been exposed to maternal stilbestrol, which is no longer in use these days, but um, in former years, it was still used. And we found that patients that were exposed to that were at risk of malignancies. Um, patients that have been exposed to phenytoin used by the mother are also at risk of developing malignancies. So when we look at the St. Siloan signs, the S stands for the importance of seeking medical help for persistent symptoms. So this one, I particularly said any, because if we move down with the St. Siloan signs, you will realize that most of the presenting symptoms would have been covered um, by the other letters in the Siluan signs, but obviously there may be others that are not covered. So thus any persisting symptoms need medical attention. If we look at the eye, um, it's a phonetic representation to remind us to look into the eyes of the patients. We advise that newborns at the six week follow up get a thorough examination and also a look into the eyes because you can have babies that develop retinoblastoma so early on during their, during their development. And it is important with subsequent visits that the eyes are also checked for development of a white spot or leukocoria, which obviously have, has many different differential diagnoses, but the importance is to note it early. The other changes that may be noted are maybe the development of a new squint, a new blindness, or proptosis, bulging eyeball. Um, I've had a few patients that have actually said they were, they thought the eyes just looked beautiful because they were so prominent. And in the meantime, just unaware that the child has proptosis and that on its own was a warning sign. Also, if a child starts having abnormal eye movements, 
It is a, an indication for the need for urgent referral to ophthalmology and oncology. In our team, we have a close relationship with our ophthalmologists that know that if they see a patient, uh, we would rather prefer that if they suspect the possibility of a retinoblastoma, that they refer the patient urgently to us and then we liaise with them with regards to investigations as we continue with our staging workups. This is a beautiful example of a child um, with a white pupil or leukocoria that was noted. Um, I had a patient present in this week. Child is two years, seven months. And the mother came with a history that this child um, was noted to have a white abnormal eye since they were nine months. So I asked the mother, but if the child is now two years and seven months, why are you only presenting now? And she said, well, I did note that the eye was abnormal, but I actually didn't even bother to take the child to the clinic because I thought it was something that would resolve on its own. And as such, unfortunately, this child has presented with uh, a retinoblastoma that has already developed intracranial extension. And as previously mentioned, the more advanced the disease, the poorer our prognosis. And in the past year, we've had about two, three retinoblastomas that presented already with intracranial extension. And unfortunately, all of them demised. Another important um, warning sign is lumps in any part of the body. We most commonly get referrals for lumps or masses within the abdomen um, that are picked up at, uh, at primary or regional care hospitals. Um, and then we get head and neck masses. So the lumps can be basically anywhere in the body, in the thorax, on the limbs, on the testes, in the glands. This table just gives a summary, um, a summarized version of where these lumps can possibly be and the different differential diagnoses. When we get lymphadenopathy, which is the most common presentation, this can be localized or widespread, and we need to decide when are these glands abnormal. Um, so glands are abnormal if they are persistent and unexplained, and glands in particular areas are always suspicious. If you get glands in your supraclavicular area, in your mediastinum, um, abdominal glands, femoral glands, and epitrochlear glands, these are all abnormal. If the texture of the nodes or the glands is rubbery or very hard, um, it's also abnormal. If you get the size of the glands that's larger than two centimeters and do not respond to any antibiotics. Um, tuber tuberculous glands um, that do not, or presumed to be tuberculous glands that do not resolve within six weeks of treatment um, should be a warning sign that there might be something more than just TB. Um, most of our patients will in any case have a negative sputum and a negative man too, but on the basis of the glands would have been started on TB treatment. So it is important that if your patient fails to respond to your primary treatment, that you be aware of that and consult further because there must be something else that is wrong. And if you get glands that are associated with other clinical features like pallor and bleeding, hepatosplenomegaly, and any other masses um, which are pathological, then you know that there is a suspicion that there's more than just glands and we need further investigations. Um, it is advisable that the patient gets biopsied early. So you would want to choose the most relevant person to do that and the most experienced. So thus in most instances, we would actually have the patient come to us if there's a very high suspicion of malignancy, then we would liaise with our pediatric surgeons with regards to the most optimal um, type of biopsy that we would want. There's multiple causes um, of localized um, lymphadenopathy, um, you can just read through the list, and but top of the list would always be lymphoma, leukemia, and then you get, again, your metastatic illnesses. Um, then you can also get histiocytosis um, and many more conditions. 
This is a beautiful picture of a child with lumps and bumps, which we specifically see um, with neuroblastoma. Um, we had a patient again about a week ago that presented just with lumps and bumps. The mother said this child has nodules on the head and is otherwise well. Um, saw the child and on clinical examination, the child actually had a facial on the left side of the face. Um, upon further um, in-depth investigation, we found that the child had raccoon eyes and had an abdominal mass. So sometimes the only clinical features you will have or the only reason for presentation will be what the mother picks up or the healthcare uh, worker at primary level. So it is important that we focus and give attention to our clinical investigations. Another beautiful example of a patient with lymph glands. Um, this is a widened mediastinum, um, secondary to lymph glands um, in a patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, again, patient with beautiful femoral and inguinal, inguinal glands. On the left, we have a patient with an osteosarcoma. Um, and on the right is a beautiful picture of an enlarged testes. We always say in our leukemic patients, especially um, that the testes, the scrotum always needs to be examined because it is a nice site where malignancies tend to hide um, leukemia. We've had a patient or two that relapsed just with testicular swelling, um, unilateral swelling, non-tender, um, but picked up on clinical examination and not necessarily when the mother presented. Again, this is a patient um, with hemihypertrophy and a beautiful, beautifully distended abdomen um, with Willem's tumor. When we look at unexplained signs, um, if you get fever more than two weeks, if you get loss of weight, if you pick, get a patient that is abnormally fatigued or sleepy, um, if the mother reports that the patient has been bruising easily, if the patient has bleeding or pella that cannot be explained, then you need to work the patient up further. Obviously, we always say that the common things always occur commonly, um, but we need to, with those symptoms and clinical findings, need to exclude HIV, UTIs, TB, um, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, but obviously need to consider malignant processes um, as a cause of those underlying um, presentations or non-resolving symptoms. This is a beautiful picture with ecchymosis. Um, so Pella usually is due to anemia. Um, and when it's associated with um, petechiae and ecchymosis or evident oozing from the mouth, mouth and nose, we need to have a high index of suspicion for malignancy. Um, it is often indicative of bone marrow infiltration with anemia and thrombocytopenia then as features of the bone marrow that has been infiltrated. And leukemia, lymphoma, and neuroblastoma are the most common conditions that will give you bone marrow infiltration with the patient then presenting with either pancytopenia or, or, or bicytopenia. Um, when you get aches and pains in a child, it is reason to investigate them further. Um, these aches and pains can be in the joints, um, in the bones. We've had a patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma that actually only presented with backache um, and inability to walk. Um, child presented with a limp. Um, and upon further investigation and actually biopsy, that was his site um, of presentation. Our osteosarcoma patients will usually present with a vague history of the child was walking to school um, and all of a sudden fractured a bone, twisted an ankle and developed a fracture. So unexplained fracture or fractures that cannot be explained by the nature of the trauma that the patient experienced. Generally with these aches, it's aches that usually wake the patient at night. Um, they may not be localized to one area um, or they may be persistent in one area, the child may present with a limp. And if it's a toddler, they may actually present just with the refusal to walk or to, or to wait there. Um, and again, backache must always be investigated as it is abnormal in children. Uh, bone pain should make us think of 
infiltrative diseases like neuroblastoma and retinoblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma, um, but it is also important to consider that it may be the primary bone tumors that the patient is presenting with. And here we're talking osteosarcoma and earwing sarcoma. This is just an example of a patient with a osteosarcoma um, with bony destruction there. Um, we see a beautiful periosteal reaction. Um, and yeah, as I said, generally they present with fractures or that swelling that is seemingly growing or excessive pain if the mass itself isn't very large. This is a patient that presented with backache and upon further investigation was found to have a mass in the lumbar region. Um, we obviously need to consider that there may be other causes of these um, bone pains. And here we need to consider growing pains, other fractures that can be explained by trauma. It may be referred pain or arthritis or other local causes. And lastly, when we look at the N with the St. Siluan signs, we have unexplained neurological signs. Um, this may be headaches that are persisting more than two weeks. If a patient presents with early morning vomiting with or the without nausea or ataxia, cranial nerve palsies, changes in behavior or mood, and also loss of milestones or enlarging head circumference, it is cause for us to investigate the patient further or to refer the patient to the relevant persons for the appropriate investigations. Um, so what do you do if you have a high index of suspicion of a malignancy or you have diagnosed a malignancy? It is important that such patients get referred to the relevant um, treatment team, which will be the oncologist. So all children, all children or adolescents um, in our hospital, we use children under 13. It depends with the different hospitals at what age group their cutoff is for treatment by the pediatric oncology team. So with us, it's 13 years. Um, there's a pediatric oncology unit at every teaching hospital complex. Um, there are a limited number of pediatric oncologists that are in full-time practice, uh, private practice, but you do get oncologists that are practicing both in-state and also doing uh, part-time private work and what is it that you need to do before you refer these patients? It is important that the patient gets discussed with the pediatric oncologist before referral. Um, you need to try avoid referral directly to surgical disciplines. Um, we have a problem mainly with our Lesotho patients that will either pre present with what was suspected to be an appendix mass or even a non-specific um, mass, and then they opt to resect the mass. And when the histology comes out, when it's checked two, three months later, it comes back as a malignancy. So we always say, um, try avoid referral to a surgical discipline if you suspect that it may be a malignancy. Um, also try doing invasive procedures, unless that is what has been recommended by the receiving oncologist. Um, in different centers with us, we would liaise with our surgeons and decide um, most centers will prefer that there's a definite histological diagnosis before accepting the patient. But in most in instances, we do still need to individualize per patient. And if there is a high index of suspicion, then the patient would need to start at oncology to stabilize them and make sure that when we do do the biopsy that we've made sure that it is safe to do so. So it is our aim and our wish that all our patients would present with stage one disease, but that isn't always what we see. And it is clear that education needs to be an ongoing process and a continuous process if we are to improve our overall survival with children presenting with pediatric malignancies. So it is awesome that we have September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, but it goes without saying that we need continuous education about this. Um, most of our patients I have noted actually present to us knowing nothing or even of the existence of pediatric cancers. 
And once we have made contact with a, with a patient's parent, they are the best person to actually go out into the community and to teach the community. Because if we start with the ones closest to us, then we are bound to get education spreading to their communities and to other communities. So with that, I hope I have summarized um, the early warning signs of pediatric childhood cancers. Thank you very much.